Well, would you take your Bibles this morning and let's turn back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 once again. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Today we take up the second half of this chapter. Last Sunday, we began our study of this final major discourse of Matthew's gospel. We spent some time talking through the discourses once again and setting the stage for this study. And as we did so, we noted the fact that this final discourse covers two whole chapters, chapter 24 and 25. We also noted the fact that it really addresses very clearly the subject of prophecy or of future things. And the moment we say prophecy and future things, uh, people's ears tend to perk up. We're interested in this. And to make the most of our study last time, we actually broke the passage down into three parts. Hopefully you remember we looked first at the context. We said it's vital for us to understand that our Lord prophesied about future events at the end of the last chapter and the beginning of this one. And that context then led us to the questions that the disciples asked in response to what our Lord had said. And so they asked two specific questions in response to his two prophetic statements. And in the first half of the chapter, he answered their question, we said thirdly, with the warning. He gave a prophetic warning. You see, in the bulk of the passage, the Lord wisely warned his disciples not to connect the the timing of his return to the terrible events that they would see around them. That that is what our hearts want to do. That is where we tend to go. But he warned them not to go there because he taught them, in short, that catastrophe and unrest and, and natural disasters and persecution and even apostasy, the departure from the faith, they're not signs of the Lord's immediate return. They're they're just signs that you live in a fallen world. It's part of history. And he repeatedly warned them throughout that section that we studied last time not to be led astray when the time for them to face persecution came. He was giving warnings because he said, my people are going to suffer persecution throughout history and I do not want you to be led astray. And as it gets worse toward the end of time, we want you to be prepared, follow Christ. So so his warnings were very specific for how his people are to wait for his return. And at the end of the day, we asked this question. We said, in light of all of that, how are the king's faithful people to wait for his return in a world where sin and suffering and even persecution are on the rise? How do we wait well while we wait for him? And we answer that question with four brief concluding thoughts that come right out of the text that we looked at last week. And we said this. We said, first, we're to wait enduringly. Enduringly. Secondly, we're to wait evangelistically. Thirdly, we said we're to wait faithfully. And finally, our text told us we're to wait expectantly. Expectantly. And we looked at those one by one last time. We don't have time to review each of them. But I want us to see what we covered in the first half of the chapter last week. Now, as you might imagine, all of that that we looked at last time really sets the stage for what we're going to consider this morning. Our Lord was giving one one discourse. He was teaching His own. There's a flow of thought. He's going somewhere. And so what we saw last time sets the stage for what we're going to consider this morning. And there are a few things, I think, to keep in mind as we prepare. So I noted them. We're going to now just jump back in the text real quick and see a few things, okay? The first thing I want you to note, to make sure we keep in mind, is the fact we said already that King Jesus established the context for everything we're studying when he made two prophetic statements. And he made them at the end of the previous chapter, chapter 23, verse 39, and chapter 24, verse 2. Verse 39 of the previous chapter, he said this, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a a statement concerning his second coming. And then at the beginning of chapter 24, in verse 2, he said, Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. So so these two prophetic statements he made began to prompt something. So our Lord set the context, but it's interesting that the disciples set the parameters for the discussion when they asked their questions. And remember the questions. We found those in verse 3 of our text. As he sat on the Mount of Olives... The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, here's the first question, when will these things be? 
Specifically, they were asking about, you said the temple's going to be torn down. When's that going to happen? But in their minds, they could not imagine Jerusalem being destroyed without it also being the sign of his return and the end of the age. That's what they could only imagine, that if our beloved city is destroyed, it all must be over. And so what do they ask secondly? What will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? They're linking these in their minds. When is all this going to happen, and what's the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So two questions they asked kind of set the parameters for what our Lord began then to teach. Finally, I want us to understand that in response to their questions, the Lord made the very important point of the discourse by answering their questions separately. It's clear, as the disciples asked, they saw this as one future time frame, one future event, and the Lord said, I'm going to answer these separately. He talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, and then he began to talk about signs of the age, and he just begins in our text now to talk about his coming. You see, in the first half of the chapter, he made clear the fact that the increasingly terrible events that come with life in a fallen world should not be taken as signs of the Lord's immediate return. But in the second half of the chapter that we come to this morning, he went on to teach that his coming would be sure, it would be sudden, and for some, it will be severe. And he uses very strong language in the text that we're going to study this morning as he prepares people's hearts for the fact that he will come, surely he will come. He will come suddenly, but he will come severely. And he had some things to teach his own as he said these things. So it's the second half of the chapter that we really want to give our attention this morning. And as we did last week, I'm going to do the same thing. I just want to read down through the section that we're going to study this morning to set the kind of flow in our minds, and then we'll dive into the content of that as we move through it. So let's begin in Matthew 24. Let me start at verse 29. I'm going to read down through verse 51, okay? I'll put it on the screen. You've got it there in your Bible. Let me read. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves... You know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that He is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour... No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the one left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this. That if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes." Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed 
and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, as I said last week, we would not normally attempt to tackle such a big section of the text. That's just not the way we typically work through passages. But once again, the context and the flow of this chapter really necessitates our doing so again this week, taking kind of a sweeping section of his teaching because it all goes together. And I want us to see it as one big thought. So right here, let me say as we begin... That I need to pause and acknowledge the fact that the passage that we're, t- that we're studying over these two weeks is a very challenging one. I, I don't, I don't want to come to a text that men have discussed and debated for ages and shrug my shoulders and flippantly go, ah, no biggie. No, it's a challenging text we're studying. As I just mentioned, good men have studied and wrestled with and argued over and hotly debated this passage for longer than any of us in this room have been alive. People have been debating what this passage is actually saying. Personally, as I read the text and as I've studied it through the context of what Matthew has said and now what Jesus is saying in light of everything he's already said in the book, I personally think that many men have made the content of this chapter far more complicated than it needs to be. I just, I just think that's the tendency. We, we tend to complicate things and, and he wants us to understand what he said. He's given us enough to understand what he's saying here. At the same time, however, I want to readily acknowledge the fact that where good men differ, where good men differ, we all should be wise, would be wise to tread carefully, okay? So where good men differ, let's be careful. And I'll also say something here that I said to someone afterwards last week. I, I do my very best, I don't know that I do it well, but I do my very best to hold my beliefs about future events rather loosely. Any guesses Why? They haven't happened yet. <laughs> they, ha- they haven't happened yet. I mean, I can look back and tell you what happened this week. I'm not sure I can tell you what's going to happen next week, right? These things haven't happened yet. And for me to say definitively, dogmatically, fellowship splittingly, this is my position, I think can be very dangerous for the church when it comes to future things. And unfortunately, my experience over the years has been there are men who divide fellowship over these kinds of things. And guess what? You and I may disagree, and one of us is going to get to say, see, I told you so on the way up, right? I, I can't wait to find out. I hope you can't either. Let's be careful when we handle things that haven't happened yet. And let's handle one another charitably about these things, okay? So I want us to go into this with that understanding. Good men have differed for a long, long time. And we want to be wise and we want to be careful and we want to be loving as we wrestle with texts that are, that are hard to understand. And this is one of those. In fact, I, I, I mentioned to Christy yesterday, I said, you know what? I'm finding simplifying one of the most challenging passages in the New Testament rather difficult this week. <laughs> it was a challenging study for me. To be able to bring it down to, let's, let's cover this. This is one big thought. Let's cover this in an, in an hour. Let's, let's deal with this. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard task. And so I want to acknowledge that going in. I want to be careful. I want to be wise. I want to be loving as we wrestle with these things, okay? So let's just go into it with that mindset this morning. So having said all that, let's just dive into the study of the passage. And, and like we did last time, what I want to do, I think to help us understand it, we're going to break it down into three parts like last week. And those parts are these. I want us to see, first of all, the coming. Secondly, I want us to see the lesson. And thirdly, I want us to see the caution. The coming, the lesson, the caution. All right? We'll begin by considering, obviously, number one, the coming. The coming. So we noted a moment ago, the disciples had asked our Lord about the timing of His second coming. When will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In light of the prophetic statements that He'd made, they were obviously curious, and so they asked Him to tell them what the sign of His coming would be. 
In the first half of the chapter, the Lord told them about all the things His faithful followers would see and face and even suffer on the earth in this life that would not be signs of His coming. A lot of stuff you're going to see and face and suffer. They're not signs of the coming. He, he said it again that this isn't the end. It's the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains. You need to endure. Okay, the, the gospel's got to be preached to all the nations before the end can come. I mean, just over and over again, he kept saying, this, this is not the end. This is not the sign of the end. But here in the next paragraph, immediately following what we studied last week, he addressed the question of his coming very specifically. He went from very general statements and sweeping ideas and categories of thought about all of history, and he narrowed it down a little closer when he talked about the abomination of desolation and a time of, of, of tribulation like the world had never seen. And then on the heels of that, he gets really specific when he talks about his coming. Look again at verse 29, Matthew 24 and 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the he in, in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds." from one end of heaven to the other. Now just follow this for a moment. In the previous section of the chapter, King Jesus had described increasingly difficult life in this fallen world for those who are genuine and faithful believers. He, he described opposition to their faith. He described attempts to mislead them. He described severe persecution against them. He even described rising apostasy from the faith. Many who will fall away from the faith completely. The love of many will grow cold, he said. And toward the end of that text, we studied last time, uh, the Lord described a time of tribulation that will come upon the world unlike anything the world had ever seen before or will ever see again. And this is why I told you I personally read that portion of the text is yet future, while some have, have argued it's not. I read that because of the language as yet future. And here's what he said in verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. He said this is unprecedented. When this happens, it has never been this bad in world history, and it never will be this bad again. He says there is coming a time when it's going to come to a head. And he says in verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. The whole planet would have died. But for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short. For the sake of the elect, those days aren't going to be cut short. And the Lord was clear throughout that section that none of those difficulties or tribulations were signs of His immediate return. I mean, right up to that point, He was still saying that the abomination of desolation and the time of tribulation, that those in and of themselves were not signs that immediately He must return until He says in verse 29, immediately after those days, you'll see other things. You see, right on the heels of all of that, our Lord began a description of His coming with those words immediately after the tribulation of those days. There's going to be a tribulation like the world has never seen, and immediately after that, something's going to happen. And what He did is He described some astounding astronomical and what we might call atmospheric anomalies that begin to take place just before his return. And look again at what he says in, the next, in that verse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, 
And the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is, this is odd. You see, he's been describing things that are always true in history, the normal difficulties of life, and now he begins to describe some really abnormal things. Like You've never seen this before. But he says, this is what you're going to see. In fact, it's interesting that this language would have been familiar to anyone familiar with Old Testament prophecy. In fact, the the Old Testament prophets used this, and and I'm going to just demonstrate to you, give you illustrations of a number of places where as they looked forward to this day, Jesus then employs the language of the prophets in this passage. Uh, The prophet Isaiah in chapter 13 and verse 9, he wrote this, Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. Sound familiar? It's exactly what Jesus said. Isaiah had prophesied this is what would happen when the Lord returned. Uh, Not only is Isaiah prophesied, Ezekiel prophesied it. Ezekiel 32, verses 7 and 8. He wrote this, God said, When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you, and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Isaiah prophesied it, Ezekiel prophesied it, Joel prophesied it. In Joel chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. So we've got three prophets who did. How about a fourth? Zechariah. We can look at other passages, but here's just four examples. Zechariah said it as well. Zechariah 14, a little earlier in the passage, he describes the Lord's coming, him coming, him setting his feet on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives running in half, turning into a plain. This is his return in power and glory to the earth. And what does he say moments after that? He begins to describe what's taking place at that coming. You shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of my mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquakes in the day of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day, there shall be no light, cold or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening, there shall be light. Friends, you've got to understand something, that, that in our passage, King Jesus took up the language of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament prophets who talked about His future return, and He told His disciples that these, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving light, the stars falling from heaven, and the powers of heaven being shaken were the signs of His coming. He said, all these other things that most people look to as the signs of my coming, guess what? They're not. These are. These are. What's more, he added, there would be another sign, not just the sun, the moon, the stars, but another sign. In verse 30, he actually says it this way, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then... All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Just think with me for a moment about this. What is the sign of the Son of Man? That's a good question. Because we have to confess honestly that none of us really know what this is. The Bible just doesn't tell us. It says the sign of the Son of Man is going to appear, and when people see it, they're going to know it, and they're going to tremble. He says they're, they're going to mourn. I, I, I love just the honesty of Jim Boyce in his commentary when he writes about this. He says, I haven't the faintest idea what the sign of the Son of Man is, nor should I. That is something only those who actually see it will know. 
You ever had somebody tell, tell you, just go down the road and, 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 and when you see this, you turn, you can't miss it. <laughs> You've never seen it before, but you know it when you see it. This is one of those moments where the Lord says, there's going to be something that people are going to see, and when they see it, no one will misunderstand what's going on. All of the nations on the planet are going to mourn when they see this sign in the sky. They're going to know exactly what happens next. The end is not near. The end has come. Now, none of us may know right now what this sign is, but we can be assured that no one who sees it then will misunderstand it. No one will misunderstand it. In fact, according to Jesus, when it appears, he says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They're going to see a sign and then they're going to see him. This is what he said to his own. In fact, not only will our Lord appear, but beyond his appearing, he actually tells us that when he comes in power and glory, he will gather to himself in the clouds all the saints from all time, from both heaven and earth. Just look again at verse 31. I told you, Jesus gets real specific as he describes when he comes in power and glory. He says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. According to King Jesus, then, at his coming in power and glory, he's going to gather his people from the four corners of the earth and from one end of heaven to the other. That's what the four winds means, the four corners of the earth. This is what he's going to do. Now, don't miss the significance of what he's saying here because he's telling his disciples that he, when he comes, is going to gather all of his own to be with him where he is. And friends, this, this language becomes something that we're told throughout the New Testament is the blessed hope of believers that we will be with him when he calls us home. It's worth noting that the stri there are striking similarities between the language of the Apostle Paul, what John writes, what, what Jesus said here. Let me just demonstrate to you something. There's a familiar passage to most of us about the future coming of Jesus for His own in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I just want to read the text. We don't have time to dig into it this morning. But I want, to, I want you just to note the similarities of the language there to what we just read in Matthew 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, you'll know these words. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Isn't it interesting that even Zechariah of the Old Testament said on that day, God will bring all the holy ones with him? It's exactly what the Old Testament prophets said. Paul, Paul's using that language. Verse 15. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Now debate about these words. <laughs> Argue about these words. No. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You're not going to be left alone. I'm coming for you, he said. This is what our Lord told his own when they asked him. This is what he tells us. 
I so wish we had more time to chase some of the implications of all this. We don't this morning. There's so much more in the text. But before we move on, I do want to read one more description of this day that's penned in the book of Revelation by the Apostle John. I can't help reading Matthew 24 without my mind racing to the book of Revelation because there's so many glorious things that are there. And in Revelation chapter 19, we read this description. It's glorious. Then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. Remember those words. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, We don't have time to chase this, but a little earlier in the passage, it tells us that these are the robes that signify the the, the purity or the holiness of the saints. This is the first army ever assembled in history to watch a battle, not fight one. The general's robe is dipped in blood. They're wearing white robes. Why? They're not going to fight. These are the people he's gathered to himself in the clouds. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Brothers and sisters, There is a consistency and a continuity in the description of when our Lord will come from the Old Testament to the New. Our Lord will come. He will conquer. He will reign. But He is our shepherd king. He will not forget His own. Clearly, the day of the Lord, the Lord's coming, will have unavoidable implications for His own people. And for all the nations of the earth alike. And according to the scriptures, it's very plain that no one, no one will miss his appearing. When he comes, everybody's going to know it. Now, all of this is fine and good, but we need to ask another question. So what was our Lord intending to teach His disciples by saying all that He did to them in those three verses or in this passage? What what was the point? I mean, why get into such detail after being so general and it seems almost vague in the first half of the chapter? Why become so specific when dealing with His coming? What does He want us to learn? And that question actually leads us to the second part of our text. So we said first we want to see the coming, but secondly, let's consider the lesson. Let's consider the lesson. Looking at the next four verses, beginning at verse 32. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that He is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. Now, there have been many attempts to explain what Jesus was teaching here. And as I mentioned from the beginning of the sermon, I think, I personally think that many have made the content of this chapter far more complicated than it needs to be. This is one of those sections that I think has just been complicated by many. The fact of the matter is that parables have really only one of two possible purposes as Jesus gave them to His own. We've seen this before, but let me just give you a a recap. John MacArthur writes this. I think it's helpful. He says, Parables have a twofold purpose in Jesus' ministry. When unexplained, they concealed truth. When explained, they revealed truth. 
When Jesus gave a parable to the multitudes or to the unbelieving religious leaders without also giving an explanation, it was a riddle to them. When he gave a parable to his disciples and explained it, it was a vivid illustration that made a truth clear and understandable. So when we find Jesus telling a story or using an analogy or giving us a parable, we have to ask the question, did he explain himself or did he not? If he explains himself, then we know he was not trying to hide something. He was actually trying to to reveal something. He was trying to make it very, very plain. And rarely in our Bibles do we find stories that he doesn't explain. He does from time to time not explain something. But it's fascinating when you come to this section, this story of the fig tree is used as an illustration with an explanation to make sure that we get what he's talking about. So from where I sit and how I read this text then, our Lord was simply using the fig tree as an illustration to help the disciples better understand how to read the signs of His coming. There are some who read the fig tree and want to connect it to Israel and they want to make this really, really complicated. I think Jesus was just going, hey guys, you know the fig trees? When their leaves become tender and their leaves start, or their branches become tender and their leaves start to come out, you know what you know? Summer's almost here. A lot like when he said, what does a red sky in the morning tell you? This is the same kind of thing he's doing here. You see, in the previous section, he had told them not to take any of the difficulties that they would see as signs of his immediate return, right? The end's not yet, the end's not yet, the end's not yet. Now, though, he was telling them that whoever saw all of those difficulties plus the abomination of desolation, plus the astronomical and atmospheric anomalies, that they could be certain that he, Jesus, was near at the very gates. You see all this stuff? You know what to do when leaves are coming out on fig trees. You know what's next. When you see all of these things, you know what's next. This is what he seems to be saying. Now, he was telling them that whoever saw these things could be certain that he was near. In other words, we can say it this way, just like the new leaves of the fig tree are a sign that summer is almost here, all of the signs that our Lord has just described combine to provide a sure sign that His return is very, very soon. Now, the most challenging part of this section is not what you do with the fig tree. The most challenging part of this section is what you do with the phrase, this generation, in verse 34. Scholars are agreed this is difficult. Scholars are not agreed on what it means. I'll tell you what I think it means, though. First of all, let me just ask the question. As you wrestle with this, you read this, and and I think immediately we say, well, was Jesus talking about the generation of his day, right? So the people living, they're going to see all this stuff. And this is why some have tried to take what we call a preterist position, often a full preterist position, saying, well, he said they would see all this stuff, and all of this stuff happened in 80, 70, uh, you know, 37 years later, these people were alive for that. There are people who try to argue that everything in Matthew 24 happened in 80, 70. We know better than that, because the text is plain. There are things that haven't happened yet. We can't take it like that. Was he talking about the Jews as a race? Some have said, well, generation might be, might be construed as a race. The Jewish people will, will live till all of this is done. They're not going to be done away with on the earth. Uh, was he talking about the wicked persecutors of his people? There will always be people in the, like, like this generation who are going to be persecuting my people, and, and that's not going to end until I come. Was he saying that? Maybe, right? There, there's some viable things to consider Finally, maybe this, uh, was he talking about the generation that would actually see all of these signs one, one day? What was he talking about? Well, all of these theories, and, and honestly, there are others. I think I read six or seven different theories this week as to who exactly is this generation. But friends, as I told you, I tend to read the text. I'm trying to read it in light of how Matthew is recording a whole book, what Jesus is saying, and I think that the simplest and clearest way to read this is to understand the phrase, this generation is referring to the generation that will see all these signs and that will remain on the earth until Jesus appears. Notice the language here. You see these things. Well, did the disciples see these things? They did not. 
So the use of you there is not exclusive to that generation. And I would say in a similar way, what is he saying? This generation that sees these things will not pass away. It's not as if they say, well, we see it and maybe it happens and maybe it doesn't. No, he's saying they won't pass away until they see me. They're going to see the signs and I'm around the corner. This is what he's talking about, it seems. In the end, however, let me just acknowledge this, friends, that We can sit and discuss, as scholars have for ages, who this generation is, but the significance of this text is less about the question of the generation and more about the reliability of Christ's own words. Look again at verse 35, because this is where he takes it. He doesn't camp out a generation. He moves on to say, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You see, with these words, our Lord was stating the sobering reality that heaven and earth will indeed pass away. Friends, can I ask you the question, when's the last time you let that thought leave an impression on your soul? This stuff isn't permanent. That house you and I slave over to try to make sure it's everything we want it to be and we've got our American dream and we've got our bank accounts filled and we've got our insurance in place. Why? Because, I mean, this life, this life is it, right? I mean, there's almost this idea. This this all is going to last. This is what we trust in. What did he just say? Heaven and earth will pass away. And if we don't think that is a significant statement in the text, all we have to do is read what the apostles took from that. Because friends, these words were so sobering that later the apostle Peter will take up that very idea to challenge believers with the thought that all that we cling to so tightly here on earth will actually pass away one day. And that should do something to us now. You see, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, Peter writes this, Since all these things, you can almost see him, it's like, look around you. What's all these things? It's all these things. The buildings, the cars, the bank accounts, the educations, the, the stuff of this life. It doesn't Last, since all these things are thus to be, here's the word, dissolved, disintegrated, for you sci-fi lovers. (laughs) Since it's not going to last, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I I want you to hear and understand my heart and what I'm about to say. But friends, I'm hearing an awful lot of Christians in our day doing an awful lot of clamoring and clinging, trying to hang on to stuff that God has already told us isn't going to last. This election is going to make or break our futures. And we got to, whoa, 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 whoa. Presidents come and go. Our God stays on the throne. Oh, we just don't know what's going to, what about, ah, ah, ah. we hear all this fearfulness among believers, they would say. We don't have any confidence in our ability to hang on to and and keep all this stuff. Why? It's going to pass away. 
We're not waiting for, longing for, clinging to the stuff of now. We're waiting for, longing for, pleading for then. New heavens, a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You get your candidate into office, you tell me how much righteousness is going to be in America next year. That's not what we're waiting for, friends. Vote, care, pray, minister, witness, but don't wait for that. That's not what you're waiting for. We're waiting for something else. We're waiting for righteousness to dwell in the creation as God intends when he rebuilds all of this. Here's the thing, we are so nearsighted, so short-sighted, all we can seem to care about is today and tomorrow. I've said for years, we're, we're, we're planning for way too soon. We train our kids how to live 20 years from now. How about training your kids to live for 2,000 years from now? That's what the Bible tells us Christians do. They wait for that. We're not waiting for next year, hoping it's better. We're not waiting for retirement, hoping we can take a break. We're not waiting for the next vacation, waiting for the next trip, waiting for the next fun. That's not what Christians wait for. We wait for our Lord and we long for the day when He will make all things new. This is why the Bible tells us that when we think about what is coming, it changes the way we live today. It changes the way we live. Since heaven and earth are going to be dissolved, Peter asked this vital question, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness now? while you wait for him to come. What is this truth doing in your life today? You see, these things should make us holy. Clearly, this truth that our Lord taught in our text and that was reiterated by the apostles should give us an eternal perspective that produces a true holiness that lasts in the lives of his people. Simply put, we could say it this way. What is he saying? If this world and everything in it is going to burn and melt, then friends, we cannot put our trust in the stuff of this life. And we do. We put our stuff in the people. We put our stuff in the things. We put our our trust in in, in the stuff of life. We cannot do this. And if that's the case, that all of these things are going to pass away, then we have to ask this question, then what can I put my trust in? If I can't trust in the stuff of this life, what can I put my trust in? And that question leads us to the second half of what our Lord said. For what did He say here? He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So friends, think about this with me. You and I may not be able to trust in an ultimate sense, even in the ground we stand upon. When you you and I think, pretty sturdy. It's not giving out under under my feet. I'm okay. Life's working. I've got it put together. My bank account's big enough. My my, my house is what I want it to be. Yeah, I can trust in this stuff. No, you and I are not able to trust in an ultimate sense, even in the ground we stand upon. Why? The Bible said those elements are going to melt. They're going to disintegrate. They're not going to last. But friends, we can be absolutely and eternally confident that each and every word of our Lord will ultimately prove true. Friends, this was the lesson that our Lord wanted His disciples to learn. But the text doesn't end with the lesson. It's a great lesson. But it's why we close with the one final thought that I want you to see here. And I want you to notice here 
the caution. The caution. You know, it's been amazing to me over the years how often God's people, His professing people, have come to the wrong conclusions after reading that our Lord assures us that He will, in fact, return one day. I'm coming, you can bank on it. All right, so what do we do? Well, we typically see one of two responses among God's people. One, one rather than determining to wait patiently, uh, they have decided to make prophecies and predictions, naming dates and times when the Lord's going to return. They get so caught up in it, they keep crunching the numbers. Well, we were wrong that time, but I, now we figured it out, and here's what's going to happen next. They're so caught up in all the prophetic stuff that they just, they're so fixated on it, it's all they can ever talk about. And so, they, they, I mean, they almost live in this dream world, and they go where they ought not. But there are others. Rather than determining to live expectantly and to wait faithfully, they just are lulled into a kind of careless complacency about His return. That has diminished their usefulness to His calls on the earth. I mean, the reality is, at the end of the day, they almost, they almost pray, and we've all, I think, been times been guilty of this. Lord, Lord, I know, you want, you, I know we want You to come, and I know You're going to come, but could You wait until... Can you wait until we take that vacation? Can you wait until I graduate from school? Can you wait until um, I get married? Could you wait until my, my kids have kids, right? I mean, there's certain things we just really want to see. And so it's like, yeah, Jesus is going to come, but not, not yet, Lord. I got a lot of playing I want to do down here. Got a lot of fun I want to have. A lot of experiences in life I'd like to live. So, so, Lord, could you just hold off a while? We're having a lot of fun down here. Doing our thing. And as I said it, we all know how crass that sounds. And we would never dare to speak those words. But many times we live that life. We hear John and we read the book of Revelation like, yeah, yeah, I get it. If it gets that bad, even so, Lord Jesus, come. But guess what? It's not that bad yet. So even so, Lord Jesus, can you wait? <laughs> and we get lulled into a kind of complacency that rather than faithfully serving and pouring out our lives and resources for the glory of Christ and the, the good of the lost and the cause of God in the world, we just kind of are living for ourselves. We're just doing our own thing, casually and carelessly, maybe never thinking about his return until a preacher goes, turn in your Bibles to a prophecy text, and suddenly we're jarred awake. Oh, yeah, that's actually going to happen one day. And we're suddenly caught off guard because it's not how we live. It's not how we think. Maybe I could put it this way. We're just not ready. I want you to consider the cautions that our Lord gives us in this text. Actually, verse 36, there's a, there's a caution He issues, and He says it this way, but concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now, now, now pause for a moment, and I just want you to think about that verse is that verse describing a quiet, secret, pre-coming rapture, or is that verse describing what he just said, that his coming in power and glory, no one knows when it's going to happen? So my whole life I've heard people use this verse to describe a coming, and it's how we, we say that there has to be a secret one, not a glorious one, and yet his glorious one is the one he's describing here. Of that day, that hour, nobody knows. Not even the angels of heaven. Nor the Son. But the Father only. That's dumbfounding to us. How, how, how is it possible that the Son doesn't know? There's a whole discussion there. A whole theological discussion we don't have time for. There are things that the Lord makes clear that He chose not to know. But friends, this, this was unmistakably clear as he said it. No one but the Father knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. The return he's talking about in this passage. 
No one knows. No one here on earth knows. The angels of heaven don't know. Not even King Jesus himself knows, he said. Now, because no one knows, we've got to ask, well, what's the point? I mean, why say that? What's the caution? And the caution here, friends, is that the Lord then called his disciples to live in a state, and I'm going to use this word, of readiness. Of readiness. The language is actually found in verse 44. He says it there. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay, so be ready. That's the point of this. This is the caution. Because we tend not to be, right? Either we kind of go hyper and we're like, I'm going to pick a date and I'm going to tell you when it's going to happen. What did he just say? Nobody knows the date. If they say so, don't listen. Don't listen to them. Nobody but the Father knows the date or the hour. But then he says plainly here, I want you to be ready. This is what this should do to you. And I would argue, friends, that this is why Christians for generation after generation taught that everything left to happen before Jesus can return could potentially happen in any of our lifetimes. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, be ready. You don't know when this is going to happen. You don't know when all of this is going to come to a head. So live ready for it. You know what? Those words are as true today as they were back then. We don't know. So be ready. Because this is true, our Lord's words here call any and all generations of Christians until He comes to be ready, to live this way. And friends, I want you to see that the king used three illustrations to drive this point home. He does it again and again and again here in the text. So look when he first he points back to the, to the days of Noah, the story of Noah. It says in verse 37, For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man. Hmm. The second illustration he uses points to forward to the people who will be on earth on the day of his return. And he says there in verse, verse 40, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. He uses a third illustration. He paints a picture in a third illustration in the form of a parable. And he talks about this idea of a a master of a house and his servants. And he says, but know this, if the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, Ah, my master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is why I used earlier the word severe, that the Lord's coming will be severe for some. Now, friends, it's important, I think, to understand the fact that in each of these illustrations, the unready were swept away to judgment. That's not how this passage is often taught, but it is the context of the passage. The unready were swept away to judgment. In the days of Noah, those who were carelessly eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, it says. The getting swept away isn't a good thing in this passage. They were swept away by the flood and destroyed. In the parable, the wicked servant who believes his master is delayed and beats his fellow servants and parties with the drunkards will be caught unaware by his master, cut in pieces, put with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My friends, that's not a good thing. 
Elsewhere in Scripture, that's a picture of the judgment of hell. It only follows then that the two of the people, that one will be taken when the Lord returns, one will be left. Those who will be taken when our Lord returns will be taken to judgment as well. That's the flow of the argument Jesus is making. Now, friends, I think the lesson for us is plain on its face. And I would say it this way. Those who are not ready, watching, and waiting well do not truly belong to King Jesus. This is what concerns me about so much of professing Christendom that doesn't even seem to ever have a thought in their head about Jesus coming. We don't make decisions about the, in light of the fact that he's going to return. No. All we care about is the weekend, right? All we care about is getting to a certain year, a certain date, or a certain event, or a certain experience. And people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I never think about his return. What does he say? Those who are going to be caught unaware aren't even his. They're not his. Just like we saw last week, the message of this discourse remains consistent. And the message of the discourse is consistent with the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. Friends, the King is coming again. Be ready. Be ready. And in the meantime, as we wait for His return, then, friend, the King calls us all to be ready to serve and even to suffer for the sake of His name. The whole of this chapter is leaving his disciples who asked him, all right, when's it all going to happen and what's the sign of your return? He is leaving them to understand their job is a readiness that trusts the words of their Lord and watches for his return and in the meantime serves and suffers. And if he doesn't come in their lifetime, okay, he will come. And there will be a generation on the earth who sees these things and will be there until he returns. So what do we do? We all wait expectantly, serving and even suffering while we wait for our king. So by God's grace this morning, I would pray that we would each be ready, watching and waiting well for our Lord's return. Well, friends, it is so easy for us to, to read the words of our King and to go, ah, he hasn't come yet. Maybe he will. Peter warns about the scoffers who say, ah, he hasn't come yet. He's not going to come. I'm amazed when I find that that is the response among many professing believers in our day. Brother and sister, May that not be true of us, but may we respond rightly to our King and wait for Him, readily waiting for His return. Father, thank You this morning for Your Word. So much here. We've gone long this morning, and we pray, Father, that it's helpful as we wrestle with the heart of our King. We want to have the mind of Christ. We want to deal with these things rightly, and Father, we want them to change us. So we ask that you would help us to respond rightly to these truths. May we be a people who wait and who are ready as you've called us to be. For it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.